Hi everyone, welcome to the Breatharian Institute of America. My name is Brandon and I wanted to today uh, present a video and a group of information that I've really been waiting for a long time to present. Uh, this is a, a presentation of who Wiley Brooks said that he was. Um, almost none of uh, what I present today are my words. I mean, I'll be saying them to you, but this is a uh, expression of what Wiley Brooks told me he was. And um, it's really important to distinguish these things because there's really no room in this video for my opinions. So if I do give you my opinions, I'll make sure that I let you know what my opinions are. And other than that, uh, this is more than anything an autobiography and a oral presentation of what Wiley uh, uh, told me about himself. Um, so just to go a little further into uh, this introduction, um, I was uh, Wiley's first student uh, and only student while he was uh, in the body to complete um, the what he called the immortality workshop. So uh, in a way um, that uh, qualifies me to carry on the Breatharian Institute, but most importantly, uh, Wiley was like a father to me and um, I was more like a son to him than, than anything. And um, he made sure that he gave me all of the information that was needed to carry on the Breatharian Institute. So uh, I made a commitment to him to not change anything, uh, to leave the lineage perfect and intact uh, as it was handed to me. And that way, uh, through generations in the future, it can remain perfect and intact, uh, this lineage. So uh, without further ado, I want to uh, begin uh, talking about who Wiley uh, said he was. And um, uh, I want to do it in somewhat of a chronological order. So uh, first off, Wiley said that in the beginning of the creation of the bodies for the humans, that basically, um, when humans uh, began to become physical, it was part of a experiment that was conducted by, uh, for one, uh, the humans, uh, with, with the human agreement of who were what you consider to be the original uh, inhabitants of Earth that were sort of born of Earth with no outer influence. And um, this uh, creation project was uh, assisted or um, uh, there's another word that I'm looking for um, initiated by uh, a group from Sirius the Sirius star system as well as a group of reptilian uh, beings and basically uh, uh, everybody at that time thought that these reptilians uh, 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 were a good race, you know, of beings that were uh, just extremely uh, advanced uh, in their technologies and these kind of things. So I'll get more into um, that uh, process uh, later on because it becomes relevant um, toward the end of uh, this story. So Wiley claimed uh, to be a part of the original creator god group from Sirius, the Sirius star system, Sirius A, B, and C, uh, that star system. So um, he was a part of the group that uh, began uh, the human uh, physical incarnation uh, through the creation of the bodies. And um, uh, it seems like there's something else. I don't want to leave anything out. Uh, but if I do, I'll, I'll just come back to it. Um, so, uh, yeah, he uh, said that basically that part of that group stayed above this world to kind of overwatch everything and part of us uh, incarnated uh, into the world. So that points to like the Dogon tribe and um, in Africa and basically everybody who feels that they are from Sirius. Uh, so 
basically, um, that's that's the beginning of uh, what Wiley told me about his story. Is that uh, that the beings from Sirius went around with these uh, reptilian beings and created a number of uh, races or uh, physical bodies uh, for people. So from there, uh, the next thing that I remember Wiley telling me about himself is that he was uh, what they call uh, the Adi Yogi or the Adi Guru, which is the first guru in India. And he said that, that basically uh, that his group uh, established a lineage in uh, India that would eventually, uh, that it was set up in India so that eventually it would be passed to the whole world because the Indians had a, a propensity or an ability to keep a lineage pure and perfect. So um, uh, that's, that's basically chronologically uh, the next being that Wiley told me he was. Um, uh, from there, um, from there he had uh, numerous uh, people that he said that he incarnated as uh, on his old website. Uh, you can look at the archives of breatharian.com. He claimed to be, uh, you know, Jesus, Balthazar, um, uh, St. Francis of Assisi, a number of uh, beings he claimed to be. I don't really want to go over that list uh, here because it's readily available online. Most of what I'm working to bring here are the things that Wiley uh, didn't say uh, so clearly to people. So Wiley claimed to be what they call a walk-in and so basically uh, he was born um, to a family outside of Memphis, Tennessee um, into a body that was already six years old. So uh, this uh, a walk-in is uh, a lot of people experience uh, what walk, uh, the walk-in experience when they go into surgery or have a, a, a near-death experience and they come out of the experience and they're completely different than when they went into um, surgery or you know before the near death or, or whatever uh, the case may be they you know if they were accountants uh, before going into surgery then they come out and they just have no concept of numbers and uh, those kind of things or interest and generally they find themselves being very interested in spiritual things after the uh, walk-in so for Wiley uh, he, he always said that this other soul that was in the body from when uh, the body was born until six years old was like a dear friend that was in the background of his consciousness if you will and um, but it was like a dear friend and he would talk to that friend and the, the this um, being would kind of help him to understand uh, things about the world because that was the being who was born into this world and took on more of the traumas of this world in a way through the birth and and stuff than Wiley. So Wiley said that he was walking and that he came into the body at six years old. Now at that point um, based on my relationship with his family uh, of, of origin, you could say, or his family of um, that he was physically incarnated into. His brothers um, always considered him to be uh, Superman, actually. They called him uh, Superman in his neighborhood when he was growing up because after that, uh, when he was six years old, and by the way, he always remembered being uh, born into the body. Uh, he said it happened at a river when the family was on um, like a picnic and he walked into the water, the six-year-old walked into the water and then Wiley came into the body and then Wiley walked out of the river. So Wiley always remembered being born in a river. And um, so uh, at that point, uh, people in his neighborhood and in his environment began knowing him as Superman because he could just do superhuman things. Uh, not only the the way that he could, you know, he had so much power in his body, but also he could see the insides of electronics. And this is something that remained with Wiley until, um, well, it always remained with him, uh, his ability to see the inner workings of creation. So by the time Wiley was nine years old, uh, there were these uh, televisions called cathode, uh, television parts called cathode ray tubes. And these were the old televisions um, the way that they projected the, the colors and the images onto the screens 
were done through these things called cathode ray tubes. And so Wiley uh, essentially began a freelance television repair business at uh, nine years old. And this worked uh, because he could see the insides of electronics. So people would call his mother in the neighborhood and uh, ask her to send uh, Wiley over to fix their televisions. So he was making really good money at a very young age um, repairing the neighborhood's televisions. Um, so from there, the next things that, that Wiley told me about was, you know, that basically when he got out of high school, uh, well, uh, I'll backtrack a little bit. When he was in school, uh, he really decided that he had to become Superman because he said that, you know, in Hollywood, all the, every body who was beautiful was always portrayed as, uh, you know, these white women, these white girls. And so uh, he always had a fascination and stuff with, uh, with Hollywood and with movies and these kind of things. And so he knew that he had to become Superman if he ever wanted to be with, you know, uh, any of these girls. Because uh, where Wiley was raised, if he was even caught looking at a white girl, uh, he would have got what they called an, a reckless eyeballing ticket. And um, he really said that the least of it was the ticket, you know, is that once you got the reckless eyeballing ticket, you know, how they would then, you know, beat you on the streets uh, for these uh, racist white people. So this is the environment, you know, Wiley was raised in. He very much knew that he had to have the power of Superman uh, to accomplish his dreams, you know, based on the simple racial, racial oppression. So uh, when Wiley was uh, graduated high school, he immediately joined the armed forces. I believe it was the army. Um, I never remember to ask his family uh, about that, but I believe it was the army. Um, and uh, he immediately did that after high school and he basically began his journey there. He never really came back home and lived at home or anything like that after, after high school. Uh, he saw the military as his ticket to uh, getting out of um, his town. So Wiley, uh, in his layover, uh, he had a layover in Cairo, and it was only supposed to be a very short amount of time, but uh, his transfer uh, uh, plane got uh, canceled, and so he had a very long layover in Cairo. And a gentleman came and found him, and he said, hey, I'm a tour guide, and uh, they just opened up the Great Pyramid because they had just cut a hole basically in the side of the Great Pyramid. So uh, he took Wiley to the Great Pyramid. Wiley was one of the first so-called tourists to enter the Great Pyramid. And um, this is where uh, he said he had to crawl down a little shaft, you know, to get into the Pyramid. And um, so he crawled into the Pyramid and that's where he began to really pick up information that he had left himself in previous lives because he claimed to be also the architect and builder of the Great Pyramid and, and the other pyramids, uh, part of that lineage and, um, and the being uh, uh, that, that was eventually became known as Amun-Ra. So uh, Wiley uh, claimed to be uh, that being, you know, all of these are Wiley's claims. I'm just uh, uh, dictating the story as I was told it. So Wiley crawled into the, down this little shaft into the pyramid and he got a download of information that he had left himself in a previous uh, life as the uh, architect and builder of the pyramid. And um, so from there he went on to run the radio station on the army base at night and because of his ability to fix electronics and see uh, the way that wiring worked and circuitry worked and these kind of things, um, from the uh, non-physical perspective, he was able to do amazing things uh, in the physical world uh, when it came to uh, fixing equipment. So he worked uh, at the nighttime uh, uh, as the uh, radio station repair person on base. And he basically, he said they had a crew of anywhere between four to six guys during the daytime who would run the radio station. And um, uh, at night, he would come in and fix all the problems that had been created and stuff during the day. And, you know, that, that they, they gave him a lot of freedom because the radio station always ran flawlessly in the morning. So um, Wiley would, you know, he would fix everything in the radio station and uh, 
he would go out and basically get girls, you know, his, his, what he considered to be his friends. He said he, he didn't remember if he ever, he, he said he thought he made love to maybe one or two of them, but he just really loved being around beautiful women, you know, being in the presence of beautiful women. So he would go pick up women from off base and bring them on, back on base and, um, you know, occasionally he would get caught and uh, he said he'd get yelled at and, you know, they'd, they'd threaten him and all kinds of things and he would apologize, you know, and then he would apologize profusely and, you know, this time I'm really, really sorry and, you know, eventually he'd go back and do the same thing again because to him it was a joke, you know, he said that when the drill sergeants and things would yell at him, it, it seemed so funny that it was the only thing he could do to not laugh. And he said he, the biggest reason he didn't want to laugh is that the drill sergeant seemed like they could literally have an aneurysm or a heart attack if he started to laugh, and they would die. <laughs> so, um, Wiley, uh, that's, that's most of what I know about his time in the military. You know, that, that he, uh, he really enjoyed it. You know, he, uh, he, he, he loved it. So, he loved the structure, and that really did uh, help him in life. And so he went from the radio station uh, to uh, designing um, music studios for Motown. And uh, Motown uh, Records, it was two brothers who were the owner. One of the brothers uh, was uh, very close to Wiley, really loved Wiley. Wiley said that he would, the owner would drive him around in his car, his Cadillac, and so the owner would drive and Wiley would be in the back. And it was like, you know, being chauffeured around by the owner of this company. And Motown gave him blank checks to create studios uh, for them. And um, he would create these studios and then he basically would sign the cabinet, Wiley Brooks, the Cosmic Man, because everybody knew him as the Cosmic Man even at that time. And this was actually before his uh, enlightenment. So he had his time uh, at Motown. He would build the studios and then the studio would hire him to uh, record and engineer the music after that. So he would get the studio fee uh, on top of uh, his production fee and stuff on top of, um, you know, actually being able to design and build the studios. And um, so uh, he really loved that job because people would hire him and these artists would come in with all of their ego and everything. And he just said he was always the same way. If you hire me, you're the boss, you know? And so he never had any problem uh, with with the artist egos and stuff, uh, um, yeah. And there's there's other stories. You know, he told me a little bit about you know certain artists and things, but um, I don't think that's really important to go into uh, right now. So at uh, Motown, uh, he was living in New York, and he found that this uh, water in New York was very special from a very very nice aquifer uh, under New York. And um, Wiley really began uh, getting into his cleansing and stuff from there. So he moved uh, pretty quickly from uh, ve you know eating whatever he wanted to vegetarian to fruitarian, and uh, he was doing copious amounts of enemas and things like that uh, in New York to clean his body out. He was obsessed uh, with having a clean temple, and um, so. From there, um, I I don't know uh, too much of his story. I know that, um, yeah, from there, uh, things get a little confusing to me about the timeline. Um, but I know that he ended up uh, being in a situation uh, eventually where he was, you know, making a lot of money uh, teaching. He was making $10,000 a day and uh, a gentleman, you know, approached him, a billionaire, and basically got him to become like a private teacher and said that he would provide, you know, all the money for Wiley and stuff. And that's when Wiley's life began to take a different kind of turn because he was counting on somebody else for money rather than making his own. And um, so, of course, he warned me against uh, making the same mistakes uh, he made in life. So, Wiley... Uh, at some point during that time though, which was very necessary for Wiley, he had the freedom to uh, move uh, out into the woods and spend time away from people. And this is when Wiley became enlightened. So when I say became enlightened, uh, he, he got to a position where uh, he no longer ate food and he uh, basically didn't sleep 
and he got to a place that that's uh, referred to um, as enlightenment where uh, samadhi is another thing that is known by but it's a place where everything's perfect and uh, I've experienced something like this uh, myself at numerous times in life but what Wiley experien experienced was something that true you know enlightened people talk about you know I've heard others talk about it and heard uh, read their stories and things like this it's a place where you can go weeks and months of just doing nothing and because everything in the universe is perfect there's nothing to do literally and from this position uh, Wiley's journey as you and I uh, might know him uh, began because he got to this perfect place and he wasn't eating or anything like that and and he and he saw just nothing wrong with death or, or dying or anything like that so he was left with a choice at that point and the choice point, as he described it, is that the world that he was in at that point was perfect. Just perfect, he said, was the only word to describe it. And, but he remembered that the world that he came from, uh, which is the world that most of us live in, had all kinds of problems. So Wiley decided to, to basically stay in the body. Uh, which was the beginning of his journey really with eating and the McDonald's and all of this kind of stuff Wiley decided to stay in the body to help humanity to fix its problems so um, uh, That's where he began to travel and kind of fix the grids on the earth uh, particularly in America uh, by using his urine and traveling around and basically zigzagging for tens of thousands of miles uh, across the United States and that's really the larger part of what the billionaire sponsoring him to him was about is the billionaire provided the money that allowed him to repair the grids that were destroyed during the Atlantean times okay um, so from there uh, after that um, I met him in 1981 and uh, when he came on to that's incredible uh, he used his time on That's Incredible to introduce himself to the world by lifting 10 times his body weight on national television. Uh, Wiley said that it would have been very easy for him to get up to a ton, and he almost considered it for a minute to just, you know, uh, present to the world what it would be like if a skinny guy, you know, lifted a ton of weight. And, um, but really lifting weights was never very interesting to Wiley. He lifted the weights until he could, un until he understood the power mechanisms of the body. And that was basically it for Wiley and the weights. He really had no interest in, you know, lifting weights or hanging out with bodybuilders or just being around in, in that world was not, you know, exciting enough, uh, to keep his interest. So, uh, Wiley... Um, in his quest uh, to fix the problems, really, he, uh, that's what the Breatharian Institute was born of, his, his quest to provide the information to humanity that, that humanity was lacking, because he really believed that if humanity had all the information that we needed, that, uh, that we would do what we needed to do to get where we want to get, you know, as a people. And he said, you know, one of the biggest problems in the world was that the information had been hidden from us so well that even the people who hid the information from us hid the real information from themselves. So there was just no way uh, out of the old world at that point until a new kind of lineage was uh, presented to the world that contained uh, the information that would set humanity free. And that's basically what the Breatharian Institute is all about. So... Um, in, in Wiley's time of fixing the problems uh, in the world, uh, he basically uh, could see that the Syrians, uh, again, he said he was from Sirius, and he said that the Syrians were tricked by these reptilian beings into enslaving humanity, that the Syrians never wanted to enslave anyone, but it was done by a trick uh, from these reptilian beings. And he said it wasn't only a problem on this world, but it was a problem on all the worlds that they created with these uh, reptilian, beautiful reptilian beings. So uh, again, they were very beautiful and obviously uh, seductive and tricky. So uh, one of the things that Wiley did um, before, uh, so he started it 
a, a, you know, at, who I don't really know when it started, but I know that uh, beginning in uh, 2010, uh, I, I knew him at that point. I'd already met him uh, physically, and he was beginning to fix things. He was seeing that there were problems with I, with what he called the Eye of Isis and the Eye of Horus. And he began uh, going about repairing uh, those problems. He said that arches were set up to channel energy in an improper way around the earth, you know, the, the Lac de Triomphe in uh, France, and, you know, all the uh, arches and obelisk and these kind of things were moved and arranged in a way to keep uh, the energy of the world uh, locked into a slave matrix. So he went about repairing these things through his body and he used Google Earth extensively to do it. And um, in uh, 2011, uh, he reached a state of becoming a man and a woman, you would say. And he called me and he said, you know, Brandon, I've, I've been feeling like I'm pregnant. And, um, you know, it's, it's so strange, but I'm, I'm, I just, I keep looking at my belly and my belly lo feels like a pregnant woman, but I'm not, you know, I look at my belly and I look like a normal person. And, um, and then sometime uh, around October of uh, 2011, he called me and he said, you know, Brandon, my water just broke. And I'm like, Wiley, are you you're talking about the pregnant thing? And he said, yeah, my body is, I'm giving birth to another universe, he said, you know, and then day after day, he would tell me these stories about super suns and super earths and super moons and galaxies and just an entire new universe was being born through his body. And um, uh, basically, uh, that's one of the hallmarks of a, of a true person who's become, uh, you know, God, is their, their man and woman in one body. And so Wiley experienced this, and he, he told me day after day kind of what he was giving birth to, and this went on for uh, weeks. I think it was about five or six weeks. I'm just going to check. Um, yeah, it was roughly five weeks uh, that he was uh, in the birth process. And, um, and then, uh, and I'll get into what I think that was uh, later on. So um, basically, what he said is he was cre he was he was fixing the problems that the Syrians from Sirius had created. Okay, because he said if it wasn't the Syrians' problem, then he couldn't fix it. You know, because it's not fair that we go around fixing each other's problems. Wiley also said he had some very special uh, things in his body, special organs. He had a very enlarged thymus that you could actually see sticking out of. Uh, his body where he said that's where the spiritual heart lives in the thymus or the upper heart and um, He also had another sac in his abdomen abdomen that he called his third ball <laughs> Funny enough, and he said it held toxins uh, in a holding cell so that they wouldn't disrupt his uh, the process of his body Okay um, uh, Basically, um, the other uh, thing that he said that was uh, just special about the way that he was designed is he was designed to feel things as they are at their core. So that if, if there's uh, uh, essentially the, something that as something as it is in its original point of creation, that's what he could tune into if there were layers over it or anything on top of that original thing, he could get right to the core of it and feel uh, what the core of it is. Um, so that, uh, there, there is a mystery around uh, Wiley's uh, transitioning from this world, but that is not really uh, something for this video, because this video is specifically what Wiley said about himself. Um, and of course, he always made the distinction that he could never die, that none of us could ever die, that death was more like uh, what we consider to be physical death is like leaving your coat behind. So um, uh, that is really everything. You know, here's one more thing. In the end, Wiley had to touch poverty. Okay, he was he was poor in the end, and so um, I ended up sharing you know my my last with him a number of times. We we lived together and shared with each other. And he said that you have to take on the problems of the world to fix it. So he brought this information from this world to the world above this one so that he could fix 
all the problems in this world as what they call galactic commander from the mothership. That's Wiley's story.